Okay, good afternoon. Uh, today we are going to discuss microeconomics. So this course has two units each semester, so for a total of four units. Um, so first of all, this is the textbook we're going to use. So the cover looks like this, and it is available at uh, the bookstore at campus. So microeconomics, and it's, uh, the author is Don E. Dot Waterman, or Don E. Dot Woman. It is available at uh, the bookstore of the campus. And if you um, cannot get it from the bookstore at the campus, you can order it from Shuangye. Okay, it is a Shuangye bookstore in Taipei. Um, first of all, uh, a little re uh, a little requirements that uh, I demand from you. The first is that. Uh, I will take attendance every time we meet, so you better show up. And of course, if you have other engagements, you can apply for leave of absence. But uh, you should not, you know, I'm, in any way, in, in any case, that you should, uh, you know, focus on the study. And when you get into the classroom, you should leave alone. You are cell phone okay so do not check your cell phone in class and because this course is taught in english uh but you know you don't need to worry too much because uh i'm going to speak uh as slow as i can and also we will put the video of the class onto the web in youtube and also on the teaching platform, the teaching and learning platform uh, of the school. So if you cannot quite understand what's going on here, uh, you can check the video again, again, and again. Uh, but in any case, uh, I strongly recommend that you get the textbook right now, because everything we discuss in class will be based on the textbook and also the test. Uh, by the way, the grade will be based on uh, midterm and final. Okay, midterm and final. Of course, uh, I would like to get some, you know, feedback during class, and I will ask questions. So your response, your reply, uh, will show how well prepared you are for this class. So that will be, you know, taken into consideration for the grade as well. For the midterm and final, it will be 25 questions uh, in multiple choice. So, uh, well, that means if you are right, we are right. And if you are wrong, well, so uh, what that means is you've got to read the book and also get familiar with the terms and then do some practices at, you know, the chapter and questions. So that can help you uh, prepare for the class and also uh, do well in the exam. So that's uh, a brief uh, introduction of the class and a little requirements for this class. And then we're going to introduce uh, what we're going to cover for the two semesters. For the first semester, we're going to cover um, basically the consumer behavior part. Uh, and then for the next semester, we're going to discuss the production and cost of producers. And then also um, the market. And for the market, we have a perfect competitive market, monopoly, monopolistic competition, oligopoly. And then we get to a little bit on game theory. So basically that's the uh, uh, materials going to be covered uh, for microeconomic one, that's this semester, and microeconomics two, that's for the next semester. Okay, it is uh, not that good to have an online class because 
Um, well, because I cannot get your feedback and, you know, have no idea how well you understand what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, it is just for two weeks. Uh, so we still going to meet in person and then you can address any issue, ask any questions you have. Okay, now we uh, get to introduction of this class. Okay, chapter one, introduction. For the introduction, we're gonna talk about some important concepts uh, in microeconomics. And for this part, uh, I don't quite like uh, the book because uh, it doesn't cover uh, well enough on opportunity costs and some other stuff. So anyway, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to add some of the uh, some of the parts not uh, not quite enough, and I will add some other uh, supplemental materials. So introduction, and then chapter two, supply and demand. If you have uh, study principles of economics, it should be very familiar to you, and there's nothing uh, special here. So you have supply, demand, and uh, uh, we basically treat it as a function. So supply is a function of uh, the price itself. Okay, when we talk about supply, is a period of time. Okay, uh, supply and demand, that's the same. So a period of time for certain goods, and talk about the relationship between price and quantity. So for supply, we have the price and the quantity. But because we talk about supply, it's the behavior of a producer. So it will be a function depending on not just the price and goods of the good we are discussing, but also the production cost, okay, the technology, and the number of suppliers and taxes, subsidies, and etc. And the same thing applies to demand. Okay, so when we get to that, we will discuss a little bit more. So for chapter two, we discuss the overall interaction of the market, so with supply and demand. And for chapter three, we are going to discuss the behavior of individual consumers. So basically, we assume consumers are going to maximize their benefits or utility, okay? And so when in chapter two, we talk about a general idea about, you know, how the supply looks like and how the demand looks like. So basically, supply is a positive slope curve. What does that mean? That means uh, this, the law of supply holds. So what's the law of supply? For certain good and a period of time, the price of supply and the quantity supply is positively related. So it is very intuitive because when goods are more expensive, then the producer can earn more from supplying the goods. So necessarily, when the price go up, the producer would like to supply more. When the price goes down, the supplier will produce less. Okay, but for consumer it's different because consumer need to pay, even though they need to satisfy their utility, they satisfy their wants. But when goods are more expensive. Okay, that is a higher cost to their pocket. And so they will demand more, they will buy more. Sorry, uh, when it is uh, becomes more expensive, they buy less. And when it is cheaper, they buy more. So the law of demand is that the price of demand, okay, of a certain good will be negatively 
related with the quantity. So when the price, price goes up, it buy less. When the price goes down, it buy more. And of course, there are many factors that can affect demand. And here we have, uh, you know, when you buy some book, uh, some goods, okay, uh, you may have some substitute. So let us say beef becomes more expensive. Okay, beef becomes more expensive and you can substitute that by consuming pork, chicken, mutton, fish, all these things. And then the same thing on, uh, you know, taxes. If you tax, uh, get more taxes on the good, okay, you levy more taxes on the good, you're going to buy less. And for example, in Taiwan, we have very high tax on cigarettes. And so it is a approach by the government that to limit the quantity sold in the country because, you know, consuming cigarette is not good for your health. And also we have um, subsidy, okay, for all of you come to uh, the University for Education, basically the government you know, gives every student a lot of subsidy because the, the government would like to encourage you to get education because that can increase your productivity and then increase the income of you and then you're going to pay more tax, okay? So, a uh, brief idea about supply and demand that is for chapter 2. For chapter 3, we discuss a little bit more about the consumer behavior. So here we have a concept, you know, more defined on preferences. So then from preferences we will derive indifference curve. In this indifference curves talks about to remain at certain level of satisfaction, uh, you can change your consumption bundle and how will that locus or loss side of uh, your indifference curve looks like. That shows your preference, uh, your preference contour. And then with another uh, new term called budget line, that is how much you have. So with these two new concepts, these two new curves or lines, then we can get to a equilibrium point. Okay, equilibrium point that shows how you can maximize your utility, okay? Chapter 4, further topics in consumer theory, okay? From here, we gonna talk about, you know, there are several other um, areas that we can apply the consumer behavior theories, okay? Um, these. For example, the first one is intertemporal choices. Inter means between, temporal means time. So you can have a um, consumption across time. And here, uh, the critical concept is time preference rate. So let us say some people just earn three thirty thousand dollars a month. But let us say he want to buy a car or motorcycle and then he would need to spend more than he has. And sometimes we do. So for example, you know, I uh, bought a house for, sorry, I think it's like ten million dollars. But my income, my monthly income is only one hundred thousand dollars. So how can I make it? How can I buy a house that is so expensive? I borrow money from the bank. And so here, uh, you have cross, you buy goods across time. So you have a consumption pattern across time. Uh, that is an application of the ideas and theories that we presented in chapter three. And also there's another one, okay. Um, so it is a provision of your labor. Okay, so when, you know, we are not wealthy person, so each of us 
have to sell our labor, okay, to get money. And that's we get our wages, we get income, and that's the way we can consume. So here is another case that we apply um, the theories of consumer behavior. And sometimes people will join a club, also let us say a gym. So you want to exercise and then you pay a little bit, okay, membership fee. And then you can get discounts for using the facilities. And another example is Costco. Okay, I believe, you know, a lot of people know uh, the major points of Costco is that the goods sold at Costco is very cheap. But, well, if you want to get that discount, you have to pay a membership fee. Okay, so what's the choice is and how people react to all those um those kind of uh you know business plans okay then you know this is uh for chapter four and using consumer uh, consumer theory is basically the same thing okay for chapter six is about uncertainty so a sense uncertainty is a uh, is a very important part of our life so that for this reason uh, people purchase insurance, health insurance, and also uh, insurance for your car, okay? But uh, uncertainty is not that easy, so, you know, it is not going to be covered uh, in this class. But we will discuss a little bit on how it works, okay? Chapter 7, Theory of the Firm. So why we have firm? Okay, is a long story. Um, basically, uh, we will not talk about the origin of the firm, but we will talk about how firm will react and what's their purpose. And one of the point is that you know a lot of people talk about uh, firms do a lot of things, um, not necessarily maximizing their profits. This is the part that I do not quite agree, okay? Because uh, for a firm to do something else, okay? Basically, the role of a firm is to produce goods, okay, and to sell to consumers, and from that way, they make profits out of it. But um, a lot of people talk about something else now. Uh, for example, there's a concept called SCG. Uh, sorry, CS, CSR, okay, CSR. So, so what is CSR? Corporate Social Responsibility, okay, Corporate Social Responsibility. So they talk about firms, they don't just make money, maximize profit, they also have to shoulder up their social responsibility. And this concept has become a in, Quite popular, you know, in the financial market. So when people invest, they want to choose companies that, you know, follow CSR. So, for example, some companies produce weapons, produce cigarettes, and then they say oil companies, they, of course, produce energy, but then they also produce a lot of pollution. And so, you know, some people argue that these companies, you know, should not be there. But, well, if you're going to survive, you need oil, you need natural gas, you need gasoline. So, what are you going to do? So, you know, I don't quite like the way some economists, even though they are more renowned than I am, um, talk about CSR and also ESG. ESG E stands for Environment, Social, uh, and Governance. So, I mean, for a company to do all these things, social responsi uh, responsibility or to be environmental friendly, they need money, they need profits. If they cannot make money, if they don't have any profits, they cannot do 
anything else. So, for this part, I'm going to give you some example. Okay, for the economist, okay, if you want to be a responsible person, responsible company on the environment, it is very easy. For example, car companies. Okay, either you produce electric car. Okay, because that is zero emission. You don't have any emission at all. Otherwise, okay, how are you going to deal with this environment issue? But the easy way to do, okay, in addition to producing uh, electric cars, but you know a lot of uh, companies now cannot and have not have no plan to uh, produce. Uh, electric cars, and also you know that producing electric cars, it is a very time-consuming and uh, you know very expensive because you need to develop the model okay from scratch. And the two companies that I'm talking about will be Volkswagen and BMW. Okay, I believe most people know something about BMW. BMW is a very powerful car, okay, with a lot of horsepower, and also very comfortable, okay, and the cars are very expensive. So, if BMW really, I this called CSR company, okay, they want to be a responsible citizen, okay, for the Earth, and to be very environmental friendly. They should forget about all these things. But remember, if you are a consumer, if you are a driver, what would you like? You like big cars, comfortable cars. You like a lot of horsepower, right? So how can you get a compromise on all these? So supposedly. Um, the EU, this European Union, if they impose a carbon tax, so if your car has to, you know, if your cars consume a lot of gasoline and produce a lot of uh, pollutions, then you pay more. And so, carbon tax serve function as a tax on the company. So then. Because this is a cost, this is a requirement, so that the company will have to produce the, you know, up to the environmental standard required by EU. But as a matter of fact, BMW have never done that. Okay, they instead, what have they done? They pay lobbyists. Okay, they pay money to some people to lobby. Against such kind of regulation, so um, I think some economists may have exaggerated uh, the role of CSR or ESG. Another example is that you know probably eight years ago, you know people, American governments, uh, they realized that Volkswagen actually cheated, okay, in their emission figures, okay, so. Because if you want to have a lower emission, or if you feel the emission of the cars can satisfy uh, the regulation of the U.S., you know it is simply too expensive. Okay, and so what they have done is that they use software, okay, to cheat, okay, to cheat the machine. So when the machine, I mean, when the software detects that. Okay, when the company, uh, sorry, the car is actually under emission tests, it technically, okay, lower down, purposely lower down the emission. So seemingly, the cars seems like fulfill the standards of the emission requirement, but as a matter of fact, it's not. So they cheat. So they spend money on cheating rather than, you know, devising. A new engine that you know has low emissions. So really, 
a lot of people talk about why a firm exists and you know the maximization of their profits no longer works uh, to explain the behavior of firms I think that's really not quite right but anyway we will talk a bit uh, uh, talk a little bit about all these and the important part for the firm is it has two sides one is production and one is cost um, basically this is called duality um, because uh, a firm if it wants to produce it has to get factors of production labor capital all the things to produce things and when they purchase labor capital and all other factors of production when they know about the cost so basically um, for a firm if we want to know about its cost we can derive from production and if we want to know about the production we can derive it from the cost so basically cost and production is the same thing okay and so when a firm maximizes the profits it also minimizes the cost and we will get into more details uh, when we talk about the theory of the firm and so then after finishing uh, the consumer behavior and also the theories of the firm we're going to get to the market the first one we're going to get to is the perfectly competitive market okay perfectly competitive markets is the best we can have okay because in this case the the firm okay because there are so many firms and no one can affect the price of the market every producer is a uh, price taker and in this case the production level will be the highest and here we're going to talk about uh, how a firm going to maximize profit the rule is for marginal revenue to be equal to marginal cost so marginal revenue MR is equal to MC marginal cost in this case um, the firm gets whatever they deserve okay for the cost they put in and the money they get MR okay is equal to their marginal cost so means that there is no exploitation on the consumer and for the consumer they pay what they deserve so you know in this case there is no exploitation the social benefit the social welfare is the best is the highest for the whole society and the way to uh, measure the social welfare we use uh, cons consumer surplus okay consumer surplus and so for chapter three and four you know we will discuss consumer surplus in these two chapters um so how does the competitive market works okay because the market is open so people i mean firms is fr firms are free to enter or exit the market so if they can make something out of it okay uh, there's positive profits then people will join a market and here to uh, get the profit to zero uh, you may feel very strange why because you know the firms make a lot of efforts pay for factors of production and they ended up you know getting zero nothing for here we call uh, that is something we're going to discuss in the uh, uh, chapter one opportunity cost here the concept we have is opportunity cost it is not uh, accounting cost so basically when we say the economic profit is zero it means that uh, the firm gets what they deserve okay so let me give you one example say um, so let us say uh, if person A okay uh, goes to a uh, have a full stand at a night market okay a person has a full stand at a night market and suppose you know deducting 
uh, all the cost of the food, the ingredients, whatever, and he ends up have thirty thousand dollars remaining at his pocket. Okay, so let us say a person work at a food stand at a night market, and at the end of the month, he ends at um, you know nine. Uh, thirty thousand dollars in his pocket. So from uh, the accounting point of view, okay, from the accounting point of view, he may earn thirty thousand dollars. But let us say, you know, the salary if he does not work at a night market and uh, he work at somewhere else, he can get thirty thousand dollars. So this thirty thousand dollars is his opportunity cost for his time. So in this case, even though from the accounting perspective, he earns $30,000. From the um, economic perspective, he breaks even. So he breaks even. So basically, he just get what he deserves. So that's what we call, uh, you know, economic profit to be zero. So perfectly competitive market is the best because uh, the the firm only gets what he deserves, and chapter nine is further elaboration, you know, on this principle. But you know, for a competitive market to exist, it has a lot of uh, requirements, preconditions. For example, perfect information. Okay, but probably we all would agree that. Uh, the producer has more information about the car, about the products he sells. And so this is quite difficult. And you have, to, uh, you have to have many producers so that individual producer will not affect the behavior of the others. This is also not easy. So basically, when we talk about perfect competition, if you want to have uh, a market that looks more like perfect competition generally okay generally it is food okay so if you eat rice if you eat wheat uh, it doesn't matter which one is the producer okay but let us say if you want to uh, buy cars sorry it's going to be very different from Toyota from GM Okay, from BMW, we just talked about, right? If you want a luxury car, probably, you know, BMW is a better choice rather than Toyota, okay, or uh, Honda, or say GM, okay? So basically, um, it's not quite easy to find many producers for a lot of products, but food, okay, wheat, rice, uh, or drinks, water, okay, uh, that is something that, you know, more closely uh, resemble perfect competition, but for all others, I think it's quite difficult. Okay, anyway, the next chapter will be monopoly and monopolistic competition. So basically, monopoly, mono means one, okay, so that means there is only one producer, okay, only one producer. Now, and uh, poly means to sell. So there's only one people, one firm selling the products, okay? So in this case, because there's only one producer, so the producer basically can control the pricing, okay? The example in Taiwan would be HSR. What is HSR? High speed rail, okay? High speed rail. We all know that. High-speed rail, uh, you know, connects Taiwan uh, from north to south in a very convenient way. So we can get from Kaohsiung to Taipei in about uh, 90 minutes, okay? Or, you know, a, that's for non-stop, and for the others, it will be something like 2 hours, 120 minutes. Um, but, of course, uh, if you don't want to take HSR, there are many other ways, okay? You can take a bus, you can take a train, you can drive yourself, but 
if you want to get from uh, Kaohsiung to Taiwan in less than two hours, HSR has monopoly. Okay, so usually, you know, HSR uh, offer some discounts, you know, for early bird tickets or for some college students uh, during summer or winter breaks. Uh, okay, uh, but you know that the price, even though the price is low, the timing, the schedule is not good. Okay, either in very early morning or very late in the night. Okay. Um, so that's Monopoly. There are a lot of uh, examples in Taiwan, for example, electricity, water, and mail. Okay, if you want to mail a package, you know, you have um, a lot of uh, choices. You can do it through 7-Eleven, uh, Family Mart, OK, and what's the other? Uh, I can't quite remember that. So anyway, if you want to mail packages, okay, you can do that through uh, some convenience stores. But for mail, regular mail, registered mail, the only way is through the post office. Why? Because it has monopoly. The law stipulates that uh, if you want to mail any kind of regulator or register letter, the only venue you can have is the post office because of the law. And also medicine, okay, a lot of medication, uh, it has patterns. So uh, other firms, other pharmaceutical firms cannot produce uh, the medicine, okay, because uh, the firms, the pharmaceutical firms invented uh, the patents, okay, has exclusive rights to sell the medicine. And this is the way to stimulate, to encourage uh, innovation uh, because, uh, you know, if you have the patents, then you become the exclusive producer and then you can have Okay, exclusive profits, and basically you can charge a higher price. So, for example, now we have endured COVID-19 for a long time, more than two years, and we really do need a uh, vaccine. Okay, we really do need vaccine to prevent uh, this disease. So, by the way, I would encourage you, each and every of you, when you got uh, notification that it is time for you to reserve uh for vaccines you should do so right away and also uh show up to get vaccines to get vaccination because this is the way to uh, avoid another lockdown and the reason i have to get this video to you online is because well we are under partial lockdown. So this is really bad because, you know, I can continue to talk and talk, but, you know, I do not know your reaction. And I do not know whether you understand it or not. It's really awful. Okay. So anyway, of course, some people, you know, maybe a very smart person, he can um, invent a lot of things, but not necessarily something that we need. Okay, so um, to encourage, to expedite, so that, is mean, that means to get a vaccine sooner, so the governments, the U.S. governments give subsidy and also, you know, give the protection of their property rights. So patent is something we call property rights. It is their invention and governments offer protection and give them uh, decent profits from their invention. So, but this other issue, okay, let me, let us talk about Coca-Cola, okay. I believe that a lot of people uh, like Coca-Cola, but what about the formula of Coca-Cola? What about the formula of Coke? 
as a matter of fact, is not patented. So why is not patented? The reason is quite simple. If Coca-Cola can keep the formula for the Coke as a secret, okay, as long as they like, then no others will know what the formula is. And because of that, they can continue to hold monopoly of Coke. Okay? So let us say if Coca-Cola they file a patent, okay, for their formula. What are they gonna do? After 17 years, they have to release the formula. They have to tell people how the coke is made. Then they can no longer be the only producer for coke. So this gives you some ideas, you know. Of course innovation is great, but if it is truly great, you may not want to share with others. So then the question is, why some people want to file a patent, okay? It is, you know, quite obvious. Um, a lot of people make things, I mean, a lot of people means firms, whatever, okay? They do produce products by reverse engineering. So what is the reverse engineering? So for example, Apple has an iPhone, right? Okay, they invent the iPhone and the price is really high and of course the product is really good and works quite well. And so, if someone want to produce iPhone, they don't have to, you know, start from scratch. They can just take out, de-scramble everything, the components of iPhone and figure out how it is put together how it is a simple. So that's the reason now, um, you know, we have Xiaomi and uh, Oppo and Asus, Sony Ericsson, and other, other, other um, cell phones, smartphones, and they work quite well, but they are cheaper, okay? You don't have to, because iPhone gives them the best product for them to imitate. Okay, so innovation is difficult, imitation is easy. They just mock, okay, imitating whatever others have. So because of that, they some companies want to have protection, but some can, some companies don't. Like I say, Coca Cola, okay, they the formula is always a secret, and they continue to be the monopoly, okay, the only producer of Coke. And the second part, monopolistic competition. Uh, for the part, monopolistic means that they have certain monopoly power. And for the competition part, means uh, the firms can enter and exit the market freely. So because of the competition part, the economic profit for all the firms will be zero. But because of the monopolistic power, they have some monopoly power, they can charge some price. They have some ability, okay, to charge a higher price than others. And for this type of uh, industry, it is like restaurant, okay, gas station, and convenience store. Basically, if you look at gas station, convenience store, it sounds like they are selling the same thing because gasoline is gasoline is used for car and uh, you know for 7-eleven okay family mart uh, you know basically whatever is available at the 7-eleven 7-eleven is also available in family mart or ok mart right but there's a difference because it is a um, location issue. So, for, ex for example, uh, you know, there are so many gas stations, but you only, you know, patronize a few because either because it is on your way to the school or to your office or on your way to your home, okay, because of the location. And 
this is the same thing for convenience store. I usually uh, patronize and go to uh, you know the seven of them uh, downstairs in my home. Okay, so because it is so convenient location. Okay. Um, to be sure, there are many other uh, you know features, and we will discuss them when we get to uh, chapter eleven. And chapter twelve talk about additional monopoly topics, pricing strategies, and public policy. For example, in Taiwan, we have uh, only one producer for electricity and only one producer for water. But even though they are monopolies, but they cannot, okay, they cannot set the price freely, okay. Uh, whenever they want to uh, change their price, they have to submit uh, their documents for the government to review, okay. Why? Because governments are concerned about the welfare of consumers. And if they charge a high price, of course, it's going to hurt the economy, okay, because uh, the consumers would have less income to buy other things, and producers, their goods, okay, their final products going to become more expensive. And so because of that, okay, because of that, uh, you know, there are a lot of regulations about uh, monopolies, okay, so electricity price, and the uh, water price, all these are subject to regulation by the government. So basically, there are three kinds of uh, regulation. The first one is lead them along and uh, do not, uh, in, do not uh, set any requirement of their pricing. Uh, but of course, in this way, the whole society is going to suffer because uh, the electricity Gonna be the electricity they produce gonna be less, and the price is gonna be higher. Oh, so this is not good. And we can have MC pricing, so marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. For for this part, because of the uh, distinct features of electricity firm electricity production, that will make them suffer from loss. And so because of that, uh, usually uh, the government will result to average cost pricing. We call AC pricing, or average cost pricing. So at least this can cover their average cost so that they will not suffer from any economic losses. But for that, okay, but for that, they may incur some inefficiencies because they may inadvertently, okay, include a lot of uh, redundant labor, redundant uh, factors of production, and so uh, there are some inefficiencies involved. And so, anyway, there are many other details and also about public policy. We will discuss uh, more in details when we get to chapter 2. And chapter 13, it is a chapter on game theory. Uh, game theory actually is related to oligopoly. So oligopoly only means few. So we have uh, few producers, okay, oligopoly. If you have few producers, then the strategy of each producer will be very critical to the reaction of other producers. And because of that, okay, because of that, uh, the interaction is very complicated, and so there are some other concepts we hold. We have corner solution, uh, stack cover model, bell trend model. Okay, um, it uses a lot of maths. Okay, use a lot of maths. So basically, when we talk about this part, uh, we will just briefly. Uh, outline the concept rather than you know discussing details, and some part of it we will use game theory to elaborate the competition between producers. And chapter fifteen is a little bit more, a little bit more about uh, oligopoly, and so that's called 
uh, strategic behavior, okay, strategic behavior. And uh, so some of it would be too technical. Uh, we will just briefly introduce it. Chapter 16 is about the same, okay, using the models of uh, monopoly and oligopoly. Uh, not an easy part of this course. Uh, we will just briefly discuss some of the issues there and related to, uh, you know, some uh, industry issues. Uh, so we won't discuss them in details. Factor markets, okay, is basically like product markets. So the way we discuss about, uh, you know, consumer behaviors. Consumers buy goods to satisfy their need, okay? And producer buy factors to satisfy the needs of consumers. So they need to buy factors and as an input in their production process and to get out the final products, to get out the output. And so the factor demand is called direct demand. Okay, the factor demand, the demand for factors of production is called the right demand because it's a tedious, pro it's a tedious process. Um, firms will need to demand factors of production because consumers need their final products. Um, I don't know if we have time to talk about it in details, uh, but we will briefly discuss it. Chapter 18 is about investment, time, and risk. Uh, we will talk about, uh, as we, we, as I said, the intertemporal model, okay, intertemporal model. But uh, for investment, this is um, about time or risk, so it's not that easy. And uh, general equilibrium and efficiency, asymmetric information, uh, I don't think we can cover it in this course, okay? And chapter 21, it is about externalities and public goods. Uh, this part, we will briefly discuss some of the issues, but we won't discuss in detail. Okay, so that's about for uh, the introduction part. For the next uh, hour, we're going to discuss chapter 1. Let's take a break here.